hello and welcome to worship. Whatever time or day you are joining us, this is the Lord's Day, and let us all be glad in it. I am Pastor Jesse, the interim senior pastor at Fairmount, and I'm so happy that you've taken time to join us and just settle your minds and, and your hearts as we prepare for our worship of God. I do have a few announcements to share with you. The first is that next week is our drive through communion Sunday. It's the first Sunday of the month. So come on over between 8.30 and 9.45, and we'll give you some take-home communion elements that you can use at home. Also, we're going to try a blessing of the pets in the drive through line. So if you have that kind animal that you'd like to bring through to receive a blessing, we'd be happy to meet your furry friends. Also, next Sunday, please bring some food for the pantry, if you can, the little free pantry, as a way of extending the table. We need to keep that filled. It is being well used, and it needs replenishing. You can bring food at any time, but particularly on the first Sunday for extending the table. Also, we have college care packages going out this year, and we need the addresses of your college students so that we can bless them with some goodies. It's going to go a little differently this year. Uh, starting October 13th, there'll be boxes that are pre-addressed, and we'd invite you as a, a family or an individual to take one home and fill it with goodness and send it off that way. You can find more information in our bulletin. Also, it's not too late to join us in the adult book study on Walter Brueggemann's book, The Virus as a Summons to Faith. Today is the second in the sermon series, and there are three different times during the week that you can sign up and join us. Also, I want to let you know that Pastor Lindsay has been here two years at Fairmount. She's experienced a world in that two years, and we're so glad that she has been with us as a congregation. So please extend your congratulations to her. And also, Sunday is her 12-year ordination anniversary. So those are two wonderful September... No, October, <laughs> September <laughs> celebrations that we have. And you know how it's always good to find something to celebrate even when you're not sure exactly what day it is. Also in worship, Jean Silak is here as our liturgist, Chris Fader, will be singing. Jason Jedlica is doing our soundboard. Conrad Binyenda is our accompanist. And a special shout out to Mike Chevro. Mike recently passed the six month mark of being with us recording worship nearly every Sunday. We couldn't do it without him. So thank you, Mike. And thanks to all of you and those of you who are joining us. Take a deep breath. Breathe in God's mercy and goodness. Let us worship God. God gathers us from far away and carries us. With radiant eyes, with rejoicing hearts, we receive the abundant mercy God gives. We respond in praise, and with our very selves, we worship God.
Please join me in our prayer of confession. Near one, when I turn my eyes from you, when I get wrapped up in wants and worries, when I miss signs of your presence, when I turn my eyes from other people, when I am numb myself to the pain of my neighbor, when I miss opportunities to love and be loved, when I lose sight of that place deep within where you guide me, when I stop trusting that you are the source of my voice, my vision, and my call. O oh God, open my eyes. Give me light to see as you see, to see to the heart of things, to see the heart. Amen. Everyone, take heart. God is our rock and our fortress. The Holy One has stored up an abundance of goodness for those of us who take refuge in God. So let us bless our God's steadfast love by sharing the peace of Christ with one another. May the peace of Christ be with you. Will you please join me in prayer? Gracious God, silence in us any voice but your own, that we may hear you loud and clear. For God, you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Our scripture lesson today comes from the 24th chapter of 2 Samuel, not one you often hear. And I'll be reading selections from that chapter. So let us listen to God's word to us this day. Again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and God incited David against them, saying, Go, count the people of Israel and Judah. So the king said to Joab and to the commanders of the army who were with him, Go through all the tribes of Israel from Dan to Beersheba and take a census of the people so that I may know how many there are. But Joab said to the king, May the Lord God increase the number of people a hundredfold, while the eyes of the Lord the king can still see it. But why does my Lord the king want to do this? But the king's word prevailed against Joab and the commanders of the army. So Joab and the commanders of the army, went out from the presence of the king to take a census of the people of Israel. So when they had gone through all the land, they came back to Jerusalem at the end of nine months and twenty days. Joab reported to the king the number of those who had been recorded. In Israel, there were 800,000 soldiers able to draw the sword, and those of Judah were 500,000. But afterwards, David was stricken to the heart because he had numbered the people. David said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. But now, O Lord, I pray you take away the guilt of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. When David rose in the morning, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and say to David, Thus says the Lord, Three things I offer you. Choose one of them, and I will do it to you. So Gad came to David and told him. He asked him, 
Shall three years of famine come to you on your land, or will you flee for three months before your foes while they pursue you? Or shall there be three days of pestilence in your land? Now consider and decide what answer I shall return to the one who sent me. Then David said to Gad, I am in great distress. Let us fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercy is great, but let me not fall into human hands. So the Lord sent a pestilence on Israel from that morning until the appointed time, and 70,000 of the people died from Dan to Beersheba. But when the angel stretched out his hand toward Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord relented concerning the evil and said to the angel who was bringing destruction among the people, it is enough, now stay your hand. The angel of the Lord was then by the threshing floor of Aronah, the Jebusite. When David saw the angel who was destroying the people, he said to the Lord, I alone have sinned and I alone have have done wickedly. But these sheep, what have they done? Let your hand, I pray, be against me and my father's house. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Can I just say this is not a text I would ever choose to preach on. We can all thank Hebrew scholar Walter Brueggemann for this selection from chapter two of his book, Virus as a Summons to Faith, that we're doing a book study and sermon series on. And may I just quote him here for a moment, that in this chapter, after he goes through some explanation of the story I just read, he says, I do not think for one moment that there is any ready transfer from this narrative to our real life crisis with the virus. I may or may not have thrown the book across the room at that point and called out, then why am I reading this? Thankfully, I picked the book back up. And I kept at it because I knew Sunday was coming. And then I read through a commentary or two. And while it might take some work for the modern reader like me and like us to unpack what is going on here and what it means... The mercy of the Lord shines through in this text, and there is encouragement that it shines in our lives, too. The books of 1st and 2nd Samuel spell out a crucial period of transition and change in the story of ancient Israel. Scholar Bruce Birch writes, at the opening of 1st Samuel, Israel is a loose federation of tribes, experiencing both external threat from the military superior Philistines and an internal crisis because of corruption. At the conclusion of 2 Samuel, which is what we read today, an emerging monarchy is firmly in place under David. He has weathered various threats to the integrity of the kingdom and is preparing to establish a hereditary dynasty in Israel. By the time we've gotten to the end of this book, we've seen David go from being a young shepherd boy to fighting Goliath to becoming king to making really bad decisions out of desire and power to repenting and praising God. We have seen David and God with David run the full spectrum of being human. Now in the story we just read, we don't know why God is upset again. But God is, and God instigates some trouble. God suggests to David that he should conduct a census. We are living in the middle of a census. The conversation currently in our country revolves around how we're going to complete the census during COVID times, who should be counted and how, what are the legal ramifications and fears of responding or not to the census, and how can we protect the census takers from illness. But in this ancient story, the concerns are a bit different. As Brueggemann explains, David is seduced, nice choice of words, Brueggemann, into conducting a census. A census is, of course, a tool of the state that is most often designed in order to administrate, A, the tax rolls, or B, 
the manpower roster for military conscription. Did you notice in the passage there were all those men who could hold a sword? Subsequently, he continues, David is aware that such a royal act in numbering the people is a sin in which he has acted very foolishly. He must answer for his foolishness because the God in whom he trusts is not big on either tax rolls or military rosters. So David's in trouble again. Luckily, Gad, a prophet, is nearby and hears these words of the Lord. He brings this word to David, telling them that he gets to pick the punishment for these acts. Will it be three years of famine, three months of warfare, or three days of pestilence? I'm not clear how one even begins to pick between those terrible choices, but David has experienced wrath at both the hands of humans and of God, and so he decides on the three days of pestilence, pestilence being a fatal widespread disease, because he knows that God has been merciful before, and he hopes that God will be merciful again. And he doesn't have that much hope or trust in humanity. Why would he? Mercy is defined as compassion or forgiveness shown towards someone whom it is within one's power to punish or harm. Mercy isn't something casually thrown about by humans, though I wish that it were. Mercy is most often a part of God's work. And so right there, in that moment, with David's decision of pestilence, this story turns into a story about faithfulness and trust. It had been a story about how the people of Israel and David have messed up, and God is all kinds of ready to provide negative consequences for their actions. But we see that the one who has made questionable and abhorrent choices, anyone remember Bathsheba, has also the capacity for faith, for prayer, for worship, and for taking the blame to spare others the hardship. When Brueggemann says there's no transfer from this story to our current situation, I think what he means is that we're not all living in this COVID life because God literally gave some mortal the choice between famine, warfare, or pestilence as a negative consequence. Brueggemann and I are not ready to say that God sent this plague to us so directly as is shown in 2 Samuel. But I do think that our examination of this text prompts questions about our current reality When you look at the world through the lens of power, you see the same story playing out again and again, but with different details. Birch comments, to read this final story of David is to realize how casually those who hold authority and power exercise it without considering how the bureaucracies of power are experienced by those on the margins of society to those who live their lives outside the circles of power and on the margins of social order, such processes are threatening and dangerous even a census. And so this odd story of a census stands as a reminder that we must look at our programs and policies through the eyes of those at the margin if we are to be certain that our efforts contribute to the wholeness of all whom our actions touch. In our current world, the margins are no longer silent. Let's be honest, they never really were. But right now, the voices of those who have been pushed aside are collecting together, growing louder, and demanding to be heard. And those of us who have been at the center low these many years cannot avoid the reality of what our centeredness has done to others. In this ancient story, we see real confession. And we also see an invitation. David is not abandoned by God. The complete opposite is true. David chooses the consequence that he knows God will be in charge of. 
because he has experienced God's mercy before and he hopes to again. This is not merely an act of trying to wiggle out a punishment. David's act of confession, his willingness to be powerless, vulnerable, and authentic before God showed the depth of his trust. And we see that when one confesses in this way, there are new possibilities for restored relationships, both with God and with those around them. God works in these places of vulnerability, authenticity, and repentance. Earlier this week, several denominational leaders included our stated clerk, the Reverend Dr. J. Herbert Nelson II, and Mission Agency Executive Director Reverend Diane Moffitt put out a public statement. I want to read a bit of it for you today, and you can find a link to the entire statement on the PCUSA website and on our Facebook page. They write this. We grieve with Breonna Taylor's family and continue to lift them up in prayer as her community seeks to heal. This is a travesty. People of color should not have to live in fear of those who are called to protect and serve. We as a church have the responsibility to be about the business of redeeming humanity and giving light to all that is taking place in order that justice will reign for all people, not just a privileged few. Throughout human history, our ability to live in harmony with one another has been compromised. Whether it was pride, greed, or bias, we have sought to take advantage of one another through race, privilege, wealth, and other means, and have used these forms of power to gain control. As Presbyterians, We honor all people as children of God, but we, in reality, have succumbed to pride, selfishness, and the love of power. Our history is replete with racial pride that has undergirded generations of exploitation of people of color, more often than not to drive economic engines that have fed our privileged way of life. How can the creator be pleased with this aspect of history? The only proper response is repentance, what our scriptures call turning around. Real confession is necessary to the restoration and creation of relationships and of God's kingdom here on earth. As Brueggemann encourages, we may dare imagine with David that the final word is not pestilence, it is mercy. Friends, there are scientific reasons why we're in the middle of this COVID time. There are also institutional and power and greed-filled reasons why we are here. I don't have the training or the 20,000-foot view to understand all the factors and causes and effects that have brought us to this moment. But what I do know is that God is in the middle of it with us. And God is working really hard, opening our eyes to a fuller reality, giving us visions of how things could be different, better, paving the way for new and restored relationships and showing mercy, showing forgiveness, showing compassion. When we come to God with our true selves, with our messy and ugly and sinful selves, God is ready to listen. Pestilence is never the final word. Mercy is. Thanks be to God. Alleluia and amen. Yes,
Listen and ponder on this pastoral prayer on counting and being accountable. As required by our Constitution, we are amid a census. Our government wants to know how, how many wants to have all the data it can mobilize. We have been counting forever. Caesar counted and sent folks to Bethlehem to sign up before Caesar. No doubt Pharaoh and Nebuchadnezzar counted. And Caesar, the Holy Empire, and every modern nation counted. All counted. All count. To have a complete roster for the military draft, to have a list for the IRS. Our father of faith, David, counted. And then he had to answer. He had to pay for his pride. He had to be brought back to his place. When he chose his poison, he chose you. He chose you as his judge over the threat of natu natural disaster over the prospect of human brutality. He chose you because he reckoned you in your judgment filled with mercy. We are in a prideful counting are answerable to you. Facing the cost of our pride, we choose you. We choose you and your compassion. We choose you because we trust that you do not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our inequities. 
So we choose you and begin again, chastened and filled with fresh possibilities. So let us in silence lift our prayers for our family and friends, our community and our nation, world and ourselves. Pray. Let us pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So Conrad picked the hymns this week, and he sent them over to me, and so I'm looking through my hymnal trying to figure out if I can sing along, and I get to this one, and I realize, I know this. It's the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. We heard Chris sing, we don't need to hear me. The point is, it's all a blessing. Pestilence does not have the last word. God's mercy does. So as you go into the world, whatever that looks like for you, believe it, know it, live it, share that good news. And know that you are surrounded by the love of God, the peace of Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit. And may that strengthen you to be God's glad and faithful people this day, and forevermore. Amen. Amen.